which may alter the pH in addition to the uh, issue of increasing atmospheric CO2. And there are other factors and other modulators, some of which I'll talk about, including things like changing alkalinity loads and uh, increased uh, sulfide oxidation, and factors that are involved in climatic changes that are impacting our estuarine systems as well. So it's, as most scientists will tell you, things are more complex than uh, we normally assume. But I think it's very important to put those links in there when we start talking about estuaries, which are highly productive systems, as opposed to the open ocean, where you know we don't have that high productivity and there's more of a real direct connection between atmospheric CO2 balance and the uh, pH in, in, uh, in, the, in the surface ocean waters. So one thing that's really important and that uh, we all uh, are aware of and uh, should be aware of in terms of long-term data sets is making measurements that are uniform because in estuaries as well as other productive waters, there are big changes in pH that are, occur on a dial basis. And of course, they have to do with photosynthesis and respiration in the system. And this is just an idealized graph showing you how much pH can change, uh, particularly in systems that have high eutrophication or high production. So there are big swings in pH. And so it's important to monitor uh, uniformly if we're going to have a long-term data set so that you're not at the bottom for one survey and at the top for another. So that's a very important uh, thing to keep in mind. The other thing is that there are effects of uh, major perturbations in estuaries and coastal systems. And what I'm showing you here on the left-hand side is uh, the impacts of Hurricane Florence, which we had in 2018. And you can see the humic stained waters uh, coming out of the watersheds of the Almar Pamlico Sound System. and essentially going out the inlets out in the coastal ocean. So there are big perturbations that impact the system as well. Uh, the, the diagram on the right is very complex, but I think if you uh, want to know more about that in terms of the interactions between organic matter loading, uh, impacts on PCO2 and CO2 exchange, uh, go to the Joey Croswell et al. paper in 2014, and I'll be more than glad to uh, send a copy that paper to folks uh, if they're interested. Also, Chris Osborne's paper in 2019 discusses the impacts of these major organic uh, matter loading events that we see with hurricanes as well and tropical storms. So what do these things look like uh, when we have a ongoing monitoring program that actually is going uh, monitoring all the time? And that is the uh, Ferrymont project in, uh, that we have going on the Almal Pamlico Sound System and also the Noose River. And that red arrow down there that you see, um, that's, uh, let's see if I can move the cursor here. Oops, I'm hoping to be able to move that cursor. Let's see if we can move that thing. Well, I can't move the cursor, so I'm not sure why I can't move it, but, oh, here we go. Okay, well, anyway, the the data that I'm showing you here is data basically that is uh, that is from a ferry that's going across the Noose River estuary, which is this estuary in here. Um, and you can see that, uh, and, and what this data uh, portrays is what happened before we had uh, Hurricane Irene in 2011 and then afterwards. And of course the dashed areas when the uh, ferries were not able to operate. And we're looking at chlorophyll PCO2 in the water and pH. And what you can see is that there are tremendous uh, changes that go on in relation to nutrient loading, but also flushing that control the chlorophyll in the uh, system. Um, let's see if I can. Oh, we, here we go. There we go. Uh, after the event, and then uh, so you can see that you know we had the major event, then it did a lot of flushing. And as things slowed down, we started to get algal blooms in the system. Uh, and then uh, um, respiration of the organic matter that was formed in the system right in here and uh, changes in pH. So you can see that uh, the pH went up, obviously, with the bloom. Uh, 
And then it went back down as the organic matter from the broom started to get decomposed. So these, these factors are all interacting to tell us what the pH is essentially in the system at any one time. And it shows you how dynamic things are. By the way, this is uh, going from one side of the estuary to the other. So the ferry is running back and forth, back and forth, 20 times a day, recording all this data. Okay, uh, another look at this uh, using a, a different way of plotting the data. This is with Hurricane Matthew, uh, where we see uh, the hurricane. Uh, this is the freshwater discharge going through the Noose River estuary after the hurricane. It uh, flushed the algae out of the system, obviously, uh, due to the, high, the low residence time. But it replaced the algae, essentially, with organic matter that came in from the watershed. So we had this big swing from autochthonous production in the system, or production in situ in the system, to uh, external organic matter being put in. And as you can imagine, those would have huge impacts on pH uh, and uh, DIC and all the other factors as well. So again, very dynamic in these systems. And speaking of hurricanes, uh, we've done some work on this. Uh, I should say really Joey Croswell, uh, and who was one of my PhD students back in the, the uh, 2014 time period. And Joey was making uh, PCO2 measurements on the fly in a boat uh, on the Noose River Estuary as part of our ModMon uh, program. And what you can see here in the upper part of this graph is the uh, PCO2. So um, what you can see is that normally uh, PCO2 would be below the zero line because the system is absorbing CO2 uh, at a greater rate than it's giving it up. But then as the hurricanes come along, you get this tremendous venting that's going on with CO2 leaving the system. And here are just several events that uh, he was able to capture. Uh, this is the loading of organic matter that came in from these systems as well. Uh, and one thing I wanted to point out is that uh, Hurricane Irene, again, uh, vented as much CO2 from this one event as was fixed uh, in primary productivity measure measurements for the entire year. So one storm can essentially vent out as much CO2 as what's being absorbed uh, by the phytoplankton during an entire year. So it's an extremely dynamic situation. And again, you would expect uh, big impacts on, uh, on, uh, on pH, as well as the factors that are driving pH, including organic matter. The other thing that's important to note is that we have a spatial issue with, uh, with this as well. And these are four plots that are uh, aircraft-mounted sea whiffs um, images of chlorophyll for the Almaro Pamlico sound system that Larry Harding made uh, in his aircraft uh, when he flew over on a project that we had back in the early 2000s. And what you can see is that when the flow is low, um, runoff and discharge being low, most of the production is going on in the upper parts of the estuaries. Then as the flow increases, you're getting more nutrients put into the system, but also the discharge is greater, and uh, so the absolute flow into the Pamlico Sound is greater, and you can see the blooms are not only greater, but they're being moved into the Pamlico Sound. And then as you get a tropical event, in this case a tropical depression that we had in July, uh, the estuaries are no longer that productive because they're essentially pipelines for nutrients and everything else to move into Pamlico Sound, and most of the action in terms of production is going on in Pamlico Sound. And here we're back to a moderate flow regime, which you can see is more or less like the, the upper one here. So there's a big spatial issue as well, in addition to the temporal issues in terms of making these kinds of measurements that we uh, are, are putting into our long-term data set. Okay, on this slide, I would encourage you to go to the full um, screen uh, mode. And what we're looking at here, essentially, is the um, uh, looking at what's going on with uh, the data set uh, from the ModMon program, which monitors the New Server estuary here, uh, 11 stations that are monitored uh, bi-weekly. Uh, in uh, throughout the year, and then also the ferrymon data, but I'm not showing you that data, just the modmon data. 
And what we're looking at here is pH, okay? pH in the surface water. So this is the uh, means, uh, I'm sorry, this is the regression line of all that data, the red line. This is the, the yearly average going through this uh, many years. And this is the surface pH. This is the bottom pH. And I think the first thing that um, seems obvious is that there's a lot of variability. And that variability has to do with the things that I've been talking about, storm events, algal blooms, other factors, uh, changes in temperature and respiration that are impacting the uh, net pH that we see in the system. For example, here you can see we had a very wet year in uh, 2003, and you can see the pH is depressed uh, because of all that rainfall and organic matter coming in, enhancing respiration, and also decreasing the photosynthetic rates. Um, and as we go down the estuary, you can see these events uh, impacting it as well. The big thing to notice is that at the upper part of the estuary, where you have a relatively short residence time, so that would be up in here, uh, pH, there doesn't seem to be any consistent trend in pH if you look at it over this 20-plus uh, uh, year data set. But then when we get to the broader parts of the estuary where the residence time increases and you have more opportunity for algal blooms to form, there does see, seem to be an increase in pH over time. And then when we get back to Pamlico Sound, the big, big system here, again, uh, the buffering capacity of the sound itself seems to uh, buffer out any real net change that we see in pH. Uh, if you look at the bottom waters, surprisingly, uh, they seem to um, more or less mirror the surface water, although the net pH is lower. Uh, but you again see this eutrophication signal that seems to be going on. Uh, or at least we're attributing this uh, net increase to eutrophication over time with more algal production and more CO2 uptake uh, over the uh, loss of CO2 uh, due to respiration. And I might want to point out at this time that, you know, one thing to realize is that you cannot get more respiration, at least based on uh, within system production, you can't get more respiration than the amount of carbon that you're forming in photosynthesis. And we know that in this system, there is export of carbon uh, by fish, by just advective export, and by burial. So it looks like we're getting a net increase in, in pH because photosynthesis seems to be exceeding uh, respiration in the system. And then if we build in the export component, uh, you can see how you uh, end up with a net increase in uh, in uh, pH over time. Um, if we look at salinity, you can see the big changes here with the uh, events that have impacted the system. The same with uh, DIC, uh, alkalinity in the system, and here's temperature, which shows you essentially really a, a great amount of variability. Okay, uh, next slide. Let's see, I have to go back to... Uh, Click that again. Okay. Next slide. If we look at the relationship between pH a little closer to uh, phytoplankton uh, production as chlorophyll A, you see there is that downward trend there in the upper part of the system. We seem to be doing better there with eutrophication potential, and there's a downward swing in chlorophyll over time. Uh, but in the middle of the estuary, you can see that uh, really the production remains pretty high. And if anything, the production is increasing slightly, giving us a rise in pH. So you know, really what we're talking about is this relationship in here between uh, phytoplankton production and blooms and the, the CO2 that's either drawn, being drawn down by phytoplankton production versus respiration. In the news, it seems as though the phytoplankton production is overriding the uh, CO2 uh, being released by respiration, giving us a net increase in uh, pH in the system. Okay, if we go to Chesapeake Bay, and this is data from the Chesapeake Bay program, uh, and I want to express my thanks to folks for um, letting us use that, uh, we see a pretty similar picture. 
So here are the various stations from the uh, Chesapeake Bay program, going from up in the uh, Susquehanna down to the entrance there at Norfolk. And so as we go down, uh, by the way, if there's no red line, we, don't, we didn't get a significant uh, trend in the data. But again, upstream, you tend to see uh, either no change or a slight increase in pH. And then when we get to the mouth of the estuary, uh, you see a slight decrease in pH. So this is interesting because we didn't get that much of a decrease in the Pamlico sound system. And probably what this is reflecting is that this system is more open to the coastal ocean than the Albemarle Pamlico Sound system. So you're seeing more influence of uh, coastal water, which indeed might actually be responsible for the slight decrease here in pH. Uh, but by and large, I think these systems actually show a pretty similar trend towards eutrophication pushing the pH uh, levels up on a long-term data set. And then as we get to the coastal ocean, uh, things are more in balance or maybe even slight decreases in pH uh, over time. And then if we go to uh, this great paper by Bauman and Smith that was published in Estuaries and Coast back in 2007, they looked at 16 uh, near sites uh, over a 15-year um, period. And uh, they looked at uh, temperature, um, DO and pH, and you can see for the various estuaries that they looked at, there's a great deal of variability. Uh, some of them go down and back up. Uh, some of them remain very consistent. Uh, I think this is really very similar to what we're seeing in our data set, is the influence of these other external factors that are causing these big changes in uh, pH in the system that can actually overcome what we might be seeing in terms of atmospheric input, uh, the increasing atmospheric inputs. And just keep in mind, again, we're talking about coastal systems here in terms of acidification. In the open ocean, you're not going to see that influence because you're way away from the terrigenous uh, influence, uh, particularly with organic matter input. And also, these systems have relatively low productivity as opposed to in estuaries. So the effect of nutrient enrichment and organic matter uh, has a big impact, a big interactive impact on pH that we see in, in these uh, in these different systems. And uh, lastly, in this uh, NEARS data set, uh, they had a really nice little correlative table. And what I wanted to point out is that chlorophyll does seem to be related to pH in a positive uh, correlative way. So that also tends to confirm that uh, Productive status or eutrophication uh, seems to be a very important part of the pH story uh, in estuaries that uh, we've been able to look at, and then we have long term data sets for it. So, in conclusion, then, uh, we're really looking at a set of interactive physical, chemical, and biological factors in addition to the atmospheric uh, CO2 increase that's driving uh, these these uh, changes in pH that we're seeing in estuarine systems. In particular, eutrophication and algal blooms seem to be a very important driving force in terms of the net pH that we see in these systems. So perhaps once we start to reduce the trophic state of these systems, we will start to see declines uh, or more definitive declines in pH. For, but for now, it doesn't look like there's a significant uh, impact of atmospheric CO2 relative to these other factors, particularly the uh, terrigenous inputs uh, and uh, uh, algal blooms uh, uh, that are impacting the uh, CO2 status of the system. So the overall effect on pH uh, is really due to way more than just increasing atmospheric CO2 in the system. OK, last slide. What can we do about this? What do we know? What can we do about this? So the first thing is uh, acidification and in some instances basification are highly variable in U.S. estuaries that we have long-term data sets for. And they seem to be controlled by interacting factors, not just atmospheric CO2 input, but uh, photosynthesis, algal production, organic matter, that is formed in the system and also organic matter that's coming into the system. 
And when we think about more extreme storm events, uh, that could play a very important driver down the road in terms of seeing trends in pH. And with that, of course, hydrologic forcing, including storm uh, events, which bring in nutrients, uh, but also organic matter, uh, uh, modulate algal blooms and also pH directly through respiration of that organic matter, and they impact hypoxia. And what we know now from our long history of uh, tropical cyclones in North, that have hit the North Carolina coast, and by the way, we've had 36 in the last, I think, 20 years. and uh, I have to tell you, I'm done with hurricanes. I don't need any more to uh, write anything about. Storms and tropical cyclones impact the air-water CO2 exchange and pH directly by venting. Uh, also, uh, carbon that's stored up in the system, for example, in wetlands can be uh, advected and uh, mixed and also uh, through enhanced respiration and then venting can be put back up in the atmosphere too. So there's a, there's a very complex interaction then between storm force, uh, exchange of CO2, and the impacts uh, of CO2 leaving the system after these events. And what's interesting is that we may be, you know, and this is just purely hypothetical, um, there could be a positive feedback there on climate change because uh, if we're getting more extreme storms, we'll have more of these big venting events, which put more CO2 into the atmosphere, that ultimately does play some role in enriching atmospheric CO2, which would be in part responsible for maybe spawning more storms due to ocean warming. So we may be in an evil spiral there or some kind of a positive feedback on climate change. What can we do about all this? Well, and many of you have heard this, many of these things before. Nutrients, 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 because I think that's really controlling the eutrophication potential of these systems. Uh, but also sediments and organic matter and other pollutants that we know are impacting both water quality but also uh, production and ultimately uh, PCO2 balances as well. And then, of course, uh, reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases to begin with. And then lastly, plan for a long-term sustainable uh, development in these watersheds. Immediate needs. Uh, remote sensing has been invaluable in looking at these trends and also looking at the spatial aspects of these trends. Continuous water quality monitoring. I know that's not a sexy thing, but without those data sets, we would not be able to establish the trends that I've talked to you about or even capture events uh, over relevant time scales. And then lastly, adaptive nutrient management in response to climate changes and also uh, human force changes and extremes. And with that, I will uh, stop. Oops, there's my little hurricane. I will stop and uh, thank you all for inviting me in the first place and thank all the different uh, funding sources that have kept our monitoring programs going so that I could show you this long-term data set. So I will stop there and uh, um, be glad to answer any questions. And thank you again. Thank you, Hans. Uh, if you have questions for Hans or something you want to discuss, you can type them into the chat box in the upper right hand corner. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative, Hans, and ask you a question. Uh, so, I think that the, um, this balance between nutrients and algal blooms and export from the estuary is, you know, really the crux of, of the issue here. And I think that the export from the estuary has actually been underrepresented in representations of, of, eutrophic, or of um, acidification in estuaries. And I wonder if you can um, speak to the um, relationship one trophic level up from what you're talking about. So, uh, you know, the production is then feeding fish production and, um, you know, I wonder how we bring in that second trophic level. Yeah, um, can you still hear me? Hello, can you still hear me? Okay, good. Um, yes, now let me, let me just uh, focus on Pamlico Sound 
uh, and the Pamlico Sound system. We know that there's a lot of export there because it's a very important nursery. So, uh, so we are, in a sense, losing carbon by export that way. I, it hasn't been quantified, but the data seem to hint that that might be a really important part of the uh, carbon budget or the carbon balance in that system. Um, yes, so the answer is yes. I think that the uh, higher trophic levels seem to be play, playing a really important role in all this uh, uh, in terms of export and uh, uh, export through fish, but also advective losses of organic matter that's formed in the system. And lastly, burial. Uh, the burial thing is a little tricky because it's a very shallow system. Uh, there's a lot of resuspension going on, so you know it's hard to tell what's actually permanently buried or not. And in fact, I would guess the burial part might be uh, minor compared to some of these export uh, things that we're talking about. I can do that. So our first question is from Chris. He asks, Yes, that's a good question. I think in some of our estuarine, uh, in some of our sub-estuaries going into Pamlico Sound, we're definitely seeing an increase in algal blooms, uh, particularly cyanobacterial blooms, that are not only taking advantage of higher nutrient loads or, or nutrients that are already in the system, but also uh, a longer window of opportunity to bloom. Uh, and I think maybe that might be an even more important factor in, as you move up latitudinally to uh, Thank you. higher latitudes. And our next where, question you know, is from Din Ping. He asks, is there any uh, type of correlation between the, in, the occurrences of storms and the HABs in North Carolina estuaries? And what role does the benthic preservation of HAB species cysts play in the occurrence of HABs in these estuaries? Very good questions. <laughs> We're looking at the uh, the issue of correlations between the occurrences of storms and HABs in North Carolina estuaries uh, as I'm speaking. Um, we think there may very well be a correlation to some extent because uh, A, there are more nutrients coming in from some of these storm events, but B, the uh, legacy of what is being loaded in the system uh, may leave behind a, a nutrient bank that then can be remineralized for future uh, harmful algal bloom events. Uh, this is also a problem in lakes, by the way, not just in estuaries, that uh, you know the legacy issue is a really important one. Not just the immediate nutrient enrichment, but the nutrients that are ultimately recycled uh, from particulates and uh, POC, for example, or PON or PO. POP that comes into the system. And if you take a system like Pamlico Sound, which is essentially a lagoonal system or a semi-lagoonal system, it's really trapping a lot of the remnants from what these storm events bring in. So we think there is a ultimately an increasing signal for HABs there. Uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, we've had some really big events now that we're looking at, uh, you know, say over the next two to five years or so. Uh, we know, for example, after Hurricane Floyd, which impacted uh, our system back in 1999, uh, that there was enhanced primary production and algal blooms that took place uh, the following year and two years after the event. 
Uh, Pat Tester and her folks at the NOAA lab wrote some really great papers on that using remote sensing. So the answer is we, there probably is a signal, uh, but you know it needs to be convoluted. And then of course we've got the uh, interacting effect of uh, how hot a summer we have, uh, whether it's a calm summer or a windy summer, all of those things affect tab formation as well. Uh, it's a really important question and it needs to be addressed. Now, or you asked me something about the benthic, uh, let's see, let's go back up here. Uh, uh, benthic, oh, I'm not so sure about benthic preservation of hab species, uh, cis. This is a very shallow system, and there's just change going on. And our time. next the, uh, question, or the comment also. from Charles, so he said, Great talk, Hans. You've cis, demonstrated the importance, uh, the importance of long term data sets. Please comment on. It cut off. Please comment on. Yes. Yeah, please comment on the demand of such programs. Uh, such as the San Francisco Bay with future impacts for assessing HABs in the future. The demise, I know where Chuck is going with this. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, well. Yeah, well, Chuck, uh, you're you're you know you're talking to the converted already on this. Uh, we have a very similar issue or problem in the new Pamlico system as you do in San Francisco Bay. Uh, you know, I have had to get uh, funding from a way variety of sources to keep these programs going, uh, largely because you know it's hard to say it's hard to tell a, a uh, agency or a group that. Is interested in water quality that you know long-term monitoring is essential uh, but here I think hopefully I've given you a good example of why it is in San Francisco Bay for example you have the interactive effect of bottom-up uh, and top-down processes going on at the same time uh, uh, Jim Clarence showed really nicely the effects of uh, invasive clams for example in that system uh, how they impacted uh, production Without a long-term data set, you would not be able to uh, make much of a case for that one way or the other. Uh, so there needs to be um, continued funding for these uh, monitoring programs. And, Thank you. Know, you. I'm very I hope that fulfills your, programs going in your comments, Charles. Have, and our next uh, question is from Nicole. She stated, I was late to the talk, so sorry if this is already addressed. Is there any indication? Acidification, uh, how, how acidification uh, or basification is affecting zooplankton, grazing, and top-down control on HAB or any bloom formation. Uh, hi, Nicole. I didn't really cover that, uh, but uh, we have seen changes in phytoplankton community structure uh, in these long-term data sets. Now, um, the linkage to acidification we really haven't looked at or, or basification, but clearly there are changes going on. Some of them are episodic. Some of them are longer term. Uh, um, what the effects on zooplankton are. Um, after Nicole, I don't believe there was any more questions, but if there is anybody, any participant that has any more questions, we do have time for more. Also, Mike Wetz, who did a postdoc here, showed that there were effects, and I can send you some papers uh, to follow up on that question.
I'd like to just make a comment, and that is that I hope that all of all the folks that uh, listen in, I wish you all good Thank health. Thank you, Hans. Looks like um, and, uh, folks stay you might be um, uh, and, um, just giving you some you thank know, yous for your great talk. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, I really learned a lot. That we're, and, uh, uh, under I think that uh, you brought point, some great issues is to be discussed ahead, so, at uh, our uh, workshop. So I'd like to encourage all of you, since you have an extra 15 minutes here, I'd like to encourage you all to go to the uh, the Google form that was linked in the chat box um, and provide your, your comments. Um, we are asking just a short series of questions um, and hope that your input can can help us move forward at the workshop. So thank you so much, Hans. Um, we look forward to hearing from you at the workshop itself. Thank you.